I'll tell you the real problem. You know, I, it first hit this problem first hit me when I, I lectured in Norway. Norway is the richest country in the world at the time because of, of offshore oil. And the problem with Norway is is zero percent unemployment. And the real problem is they couldn't get anyone to become scientists and engineers. Why? Because that takes work. And everyone wanted to go into business. Or Wall Street, because that all it takes long hours, but you don't really have to know much. <laughs> Forgive me. But seriously, and when my daughter was in high school, I looked around at the smart kids, and what were they doing? They were going into finance. Because for a little, a lot less investment of time and effort and intellectual energy, you can make a lot more money. So I was particularly happy when the dot, when the dot com thing busted. Because what I saw were suddenly kids who were smart realizing that maybe they had to think of something else. And it is a big problem. Because we cannot, as a society, continue to function by just making money. We actually have to make things. And make things requires science and engineering. And actually, that's why I'm particularly happy that, um, that for example, my friend Elon Musk, who, who ma makes uh, Tesla and SpaceX, he started out doing something incredibly unproductive. He made PayPal. Okay. That made him a lot of money, but did it make anything for people? Well, it made some jobs. But now he's actually building things, cars like Tesla's. And, and so uh, it is incredibly important that we as a society need to, to value the, 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 the work that scientists and engineers do. And it, there's no doubt, although it's fun, I like to say, it's, 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 it's hard work to get to a certain point. And if we um, continue to make it much more attractive to be a Wall Street um, executive, and make build millions of dollars by the time you're in your mid-twenties, people are going to vote with their feet. And I think it's a real problem. But it doesn't happen in the schools. The real problem is that we tell that kids are too influenced by getting a job. When I was growing up, that wasn't an issue. And I think it's going away now because everyone knows that no one's going to have jobs. <laughs> and, and so I think, I think the point is that people are saying, okay, maybe now I might do what I'm interested in. And when I talk to students and they ask me, you know, are there jobs in science? Well, I say, it doesn't matter. Is it what you enjoy? Because it's one time in your life when you're going to get to do something you enjoy. And believe me, as I just tried to show you, the tools you'll get from those studies will allow you to go out in any other field and, do, and, and, and excel. So don't worry about the job. Do what you enjoy and keep trying it. When I was doing my PhD, there were no jobs in physics. I learned how to juggle also when I was at Boston, just in case. I didn't expect <laughs> to get a job. It turned out it worked out all right for me, but, but, uh, but do what you enjoy, and that's the advice that I give everyone. And the reason scientists do what they do isn't to save the world, it's because we enjoy it, it's fun. 88 years ago, the picture of science was that the universe is static and eternal, and contains a single galaxy surrounded by a vast eternity of empty space. That was the picture that science had in 1925. And just think how much has changed. In 88 years, we now know there are 100 billion galaxies, not just one. We know the universe is expanding and had a beginning 13.8 billion years ago. And we were able to do that because we can measure galaxies. But what's happening is the expansion of the universe is speeding up over time. And because of that speeding up, distant galaxies are moving away from us faster and faster. And eventually, they will be moving away from us faster than the speed of light. It's allowed because we teach you things incorrectly. We say nothing could travel faster than the speed of light, but that's, you have to parse it more carefully. Nothing could travel through space faster than the speed of light, but space can do whatever the hell it wants. <laughs> and space carries things away, like a surfer on a wave can carry things away faster than light. When those galaxies are moving away faster than light, the light from them can't get to us. And if we wait long enough, every galaxy we now see will disappear over time. So the longer we wait, the less we'll see, which is why I have gone to Congress and told them to fund cosmology now, but that hasn't worked. <laughs> yeah. Two trillion years is a long time, but two, two years is a long time for a congressman. It doesn't work. But So the picture of, of the future is if there's an energy and empty space that stays there, the rest of the universe will disappear and all evidence of the Big Bang will go away. And the question is, has it gotten more, any better? And the answer is yes, because this validates this early period of incredible expansion validates the notion that empty space can create, that energy in empty space can cause a universe to expand faster and faster and faster. And that combined, with, by the way, with the discovery of the Higgs boson, suggests there can be a background invisible field that can carry energy in the universe. And all of that su is suggestive of the possibility that this expansion will go for on forever. But it also allows another possibility, which is even worse. <laughs> because 
If this field changes, if it relaxes and that energy goes away, which can happen, it's called a phase transition, then that energy causing the expansion of the universe will, will stop and the expansion of the universe will begin to slow down and you'd say, great. But the problem is, a phase transition in the fundamental laws of physics means that we don't longer, longer exist. Okay? At the speed of light, it'll happen in different places. Everything that we now see will go away. So there's two choices. Either the rest of the universe disappears, the stars in our galaxies burn out, the universe becomes cold and dark and empty, and that's the future. Or there's a phase transition and everything we see ceases to exist instantaneously. <laughs> so enjoy it while you can. Just to catch me what on this, this is a, a doctor, he was a neurosurgeon. Correct. Not a neuroscientist. Okay, mm -hmm. big difference. Who's, he had a, he had a meningitis-induced coma. Mm -hmm. So he was out, and he said while he was out, he had a near-death experience. Let me read some of his, what he said happened in his book, Heaven is Real, that you printed here. He said, I was a speck on a beautiful butterfly wing. <laughs> <laughs> Millions of other butterflies around us. We were flying through blooming flowers. Newspaper taxis appeared on the shore. <laughs> Oh, you, <laughs> you are a Rocking miserable, horse people miserable were eating man. marshmallow pies. The girl had kaleidoscope pies. Okay, so we're mixing those two. But the first part is what he said, and this is why this bothers me so much. Because heaven, I mean, Doc, please help me out. Well, look, I mean, it's so, uh, it is ridiculous. Uh, the point is that, so you're deprived of oxygen, and what are you going to do? I mean, I, I, you may have had similar experiences in other cases where your metabolism has been changed. The problem with making, you know, well, the problem with journalism and science like that is that, is that you know, you try to have, make two sides to every story, but the thing about science is most often right. one side is wrong. Right, so that's easy, the point. You know, the easiest, Richard Feynman was a famous scientist, said the easiest person to fool is yourself. When something happens right. to you, you suddenly feel like it's significant. He used to go around everyone and saying, you won't believe what happened to me today, you won't believe what happened to me, and people say what, and he'd say, Absolutely nothing. Because, I mean, when, you know, you can dream a million stupid dreams, and then one day you dream your sister's arm is going to break and her leg breaks, and you think, aha, I'm clairvoyant. I think These things actually just happen. Fantasy. And he had a dynamite dream, which you have when you're coming back online and you're on a surgical And some of them are good dreams or some drug. of them are bad dreams. Your good dreams heaven, the bad dreams are hell. I mean, the it's, point is know, that it was a very profound, life-changing experience for him. And I'm I think sure it was. It's but it a makes... pretty gripping read. I mean, it's well, the only time know, but, but that I have so... ever felt sort of moved by a piece, actually, but I'm in sure this area. It wasn't a woo-woo piece. As real to him as anything. I'm not denying that to him it felt real. Hallucinations are real to people who hallucinate. <laughs> no, they really are. <laughs> well, it's decreasing, really? though. Happily, actually, no matter what people say, it's actually the number of people who claim yes. at least affiliation with any Certainly. organization is happily Especially decreasing. Especially the young people. Yeah, yes. exactly. And I think, you know, but access you know, to information. These people. But he's not necessarily but, describing okay. a religious experience. He describes a spiritual experience, and it is powerful, and it is moving, and I think we cannot deny that people feel and experience these things. And oh, I, okay. the experiences feel real. I, I, lots of people have spiritual experiences. And that's, we, we should celebrate that. I have one when I look at the Hubble Space Telescope images and, and see galaxies that are 10 billion light years away with civilizations that are long gone. I mean, to me, that's a, people say science isn't spiritual, but to me it's more spiritual because it's actually real. Well, I feel that way about it. I've read recently that apparently every time you quantum entangle two things, you get a wormhole for free. Do you have any sort of comments or, on that? Or? Oh, yeah, sure, it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah, not, the, not true at all. Okay. Not true at all. You, you, uh, but quantum entanglement is very interesting, and we use it. It's, it's, it's maybe the basis of quantum computing and and and, and secure messaging, and also, unfortunately, also ways to break bank codes for credit cards. It really says that this weird thing that two particles on the opposite side of our galaxy are really not separate. They're really part of the same thing. And so, if I make a measurement of one of them instantaneously, and I mean instantaneously. I affect the state of that other one. It's not the speed of light, and it doesn't violate relativity. And the reason is, classically, we think the particles are separated. But their wave function is entangled. O only if, by the way, if you haven't let them interact with anything along the way, between here and the other end of the galaxy. The minute they interact with stuff, they're no longer entangled. But if you very carefully prepare particles, and we've done it 10 kilometers away, 20 kilometers away, where you can instantaneously Chain, affect the, 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 the state of one particle by another. And we can use that entanglement to relay messages, but not faster than the speed of light. 
But it's fascinating. But wormholes aren't involved. No. But unfortunately, the laws of physics tell us that the only way to explore nature on very, very small scales is to have a lot of energy. It's a property of quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle. To resolve things on small physical scales requires a lot of momentum and then a lot of energy. It's just a law of nature. And so we have no choice but to build higher and higher energy machines. There's no way around it. Now, we may, each, as things continue, our waves of accelerating particles get smarter and smarter. And we may do it for less. But the Large Hadron Collider is the most complicated machine that humans have ever built. It is amazing that it works. It is, it is, it is unfathomable, almost, I, I, that it works. And to think about the fact that it's 26 kilometers around with a superconducting magnets that are bigger than any of the magnets you find in MRI machines or anywhere here. 26 kilometers around superconducting, so that means the temperature in that tunnel has to be colder than the temperature in outer space near the Earth. The vacuum in that tunnel has to be rarer than the vacuum near the International Space Station. We create a vacuum that's better than space, that's colder than space, that operates with superconducting magnets over 26 kilometers, accelerating particles at 99.999999% the speed of light in different directions. Each instant, the collisions produce more information that are detected by the detectors. Over 1,000 terabytes of information in each set of collisions, and there are a million collisions each second. More than the information contained in all the libraries on Earth. And how to sift through that and throw out almost all of it in a way to find out what's happening is amazing. It's amazing that we can do it. The fact that we can find out we're wrong is wonderful. In many of areas of human activity, we can't even, we don't even know if we're wrong. And, and the fact, so science progresses, but it doesn't, it doesn't progress by something being right and then being wrong. That's the biggest misunderstanding. Something that's right, and by right, I mean that it agrees with nature. You model nature, you make the correct predictions. That can never be wrong. It can be subsumed in a larger theory that changes it, just like Newton's law of gravity got subsumed in general relativity. But, um, but the fact that we can, and it amazes me, and especially since lately I've been dealing a lot with religious issues for some reason. Um, <laughs> the fact that we can change our minds is somehow viewed as a fallibility. And, and what we do when we teach, we teach science completely and correctly. We teach it as a set of facts. When that's irrelevant, okay, it's a process of how to distinguish sense from nonsense, how to ask questions. And we really need to, to base our teaching more on the asking of questions and, 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 the, and not knowing the answers. It's great. And I was just talking to someone who was asking Q&A some other place I was in the state recently. I forget where. Uh, a parent and talking to his kid. And, you know, we, as parents, we tend to not want to say that we don't know the answer. But the best thing we can say, don't know the answer, let's, let's see how we might find out the answer. Because that's a skill that will be useful. The set of facts is useless. But the skill, the process of asking questions and, and sifting through information and just trying to distinguish what's sensible and nonsensible. Well, there's no doubt that Einstein's greatest achievement, much of contribution, his greatest achievement was the general theory of relativity. It was a complete, it was, a, it was an amazing piece of intellectual activity pushing the boundaries of what was known mathematically at the time. But it's also a new theory of gravity, and it also changed our picture of space and time more than anything else. Special relativity told us that space and time are related. But general relativity said that space and time are dynamical, that they respond to the presence of matter, that space curves in the presence of matter and expands in gravity, as does time. And that was profoundly important. And of course, it was essential, because we could not have a consistent theory of an expanding universe without general relativity. It doesn't work in Newtonian mechanics. So while Einstein got it completely wrong, he thought, he thought his theory could only work if the universe was static. He was completely wrong. In fact, it generally predicts an expanding or contracting universe. And it's the only consistent theory that could have done that. So all of modern cosmology would not be possible without general relativity.